What's up, everybody? Today on the Yours Truly podcast, I have someone who needs no introduction, especially in this corner of this little corner of the internet. But we'll get one regardless. Paul Vanderclay wears many hats. He is a husband and father. He's a faithful pastor to Livingstone's Christian Reformed Church in Sacramento, California. He's the co-host of the Preddy and Paul Show. He's a participant in Grim Grizz's VNA Network, virtually not alone. He is the rando of randos. He's YouTube's most infamous Jordan Peterson expert. He is Pastor Paul, PVK, and he's, hi, it's Paul. He teaches homeroom on Mondays. He's a master synthesizer of modern, postmodern, and metamodern culture. He operates a humble YouTube channel that can't quite crack 30,000 subs. He is probably the reason this podcast is even happening. It's quite an honor to be able to craft some conversation today here with him. So it was with great honor I give to you today, Paul Vanderclay. Hi, this is Christian Baxter, and you're listening to Yours Truly, a place we go to think out loud. Paul, good morning. Good morning, Christian. How are you? I'm good, man. Good. Look at the branding. Look at the branding. You know, I, the one thing I have to say is this is Paul, because what I often oh. do is I will I will use some of Grim Grizz's language and branding and I'll get it slightly wrong. And of course, Grim Grizz was a medical uh, transcriber. Mm -hmm. And so that dude gets every word right. You know how Jordan Peterson talks about, um, you know, being careful with every word. People watch Grim Grizz and they don't understand it, but he is careful about every word he's very meticulous with his words so this and his, li is his little high. he'll sneak them in he'll That's sneak them right. in he will it's like he will <laughs> you know maybe someday i'll be remembered as a friend of grim grizz we'll see if uh <laughs> maybe maybe, maybe, maybe somebody will. will maybe somebody will so uh man well this this uh podcast is a is about six or seven years in the making that's that's the truth i i have memories of you I, I've told this story somewhere else, but you you were so excited. A new Jordan Peterson thing had just happened. You probably had several hundred subs. And then you you like sat out in your yard. There was a plane going overhead. There wasn't any uh, black and yellow PowerPoint that day. It was just, this just happened. Yeah. Like that's deep <laughs> in my brain somewhere. I couldn't even find it. I went looking for it. And I could, maybe it didn't even happen, but it feels like it did. No, it happened. I made a few of those. I made a few yeah. of those. Yeah. And, because Jordan would always do something when I'd be like going on vacation and be like, oh man, what am I going to do now? Not in my office. So I know. So this, uh, I got this a few weeks ago. Um, <laughs> you know, that is, I've had, you know, I've been doing this. I've probably done about 10 or 15 of these podcasts and uh, a lot of them. I mean, I, I feel very strongly downstream from new atheism, Jordan Peterson, this. Yeah. I mean, you're fro you're frozen on my end. I'm frozen. Hmm. No, I don't know why I'm frozen. You can drop me out of the studio and bring me back in. Let's that try it. Up. Let's try our and uh oh. Well, let me see if I can. There's a profile picture. No, uh, camera. Oh, is it on my end? Is it on my end? Hang on. Oh, no. Let me try something. reset the the cam link oh okay well, did your camera the camera's fine um let me check out the cam link hmm. here i'll tell you what i'll do It is a stream yard problem. Is it? Should I? Well, no, it's on my end. Oh, so let me um, exit out and reconnect. come back in. Yeah. Yep. You want to pause your recording? I think it'll, I think it will still just, I mean, I'm fine. I'll, I'll click, I'll cut it later. So Paul is fixing technical issues as we speak. This has never happened. 
Oh, man. All the assassins almost got us, man. Yeah, yeah. See, now... <laughs> See now I'll be I'll be talking this way instead of this way. So oh, okay, well, that works. Um, I can do a little bit of correcting, but that's I have a separate camera that's that's right over the right over the monitor for for more direct conversation. So no. Oh yeah, it's, it's all right. Side. It's all right. You can be looking at my my avatar over here. Yeah, that's, that's, um, that's what'll happen. So yeah, well I was saying it's very clear all this is downstream from New Atheism to uh jordan peterson and then you that was the core of what you were doing um i'm just i can't help but think all the i i was a pastor during that time in the in the aughts you'd been a pastor for a long time and i had so i i had a lot of insecurity with the new atheism what what did you what were you feeling i know you were reading keller you were watching apologetics what was going on with you well, I wasn't really very up on new atheism. I was mostly paying attention to what I think most pastors pay attention to, which is what they should be paying attention to, the work in front of them. <laughs> and and what I didn't understand at that time was what was upstream of what I was seeing coming down the river. So new atheism was definitely having an impact. I didn't really pay much. I, you know, if, if someone would say Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, Daniel Dennett, I could have said, yeah, they're the four horsemen of new atheism. But I would read an article now and then about them. And I might read Alvin Plantinga saying something like, gosh, I wish we had real atheists like, um, you know, like those at the beginning of the 20th century, not these not these hacks because mm. philosophically they don't really have they don't really have any chops the difficult thing that i didn't appreciate was whether or not they had chops philosophically they had power culturally and they were having a tremendous impact on what would become the missing generation of the church i didn't have any insight into that at all because i like many pastors was focused on well, you know, again, focused on doing the basic work of the church, doing, um, you know, and, and probably then more reading at the level of ministers like Keller. We're reading, we're reading sort of the people downstream from the chumming going on upstream, bringing the sharks. And, and so what happened with Jordan Peterson was, I began to notice what it, what first caught my attention was the effect downstream, which were that people who had, because it's not just new atheism, it was also new age. Those two things were together because pe some people would be feeding on new atheism and become atheists. More people were feeding on new atheism and becoming new age. Mm. And that's, of course, something that later Clay Rutledge would write about in his in his in one of his books. And that that now is is fairly well known. But and, and you can even see that in Sam Harris. And Sam Harris is a weird combination of sort of new atheism and new age. So what I saw with Jordan Peterson was I first caught it in comment threads and subreddits and things like that where people were, my first insight into it was, I read someone that said, I used to listen to a lot of Tim Keller, and now I listen to Jordan Peterson. And I thought, now that's interesting, because you would think someone who listens to Tim Keller would suddenly become young, restless, and reformed. But they didn't actually make that full transformation. They listened to Tim Keller because they were hearing something that was scratching where they were itching, but it didn't take them all the way into, let's say, Young, Restless, and Reformed. It didn't make them PCA. It brought them to Jordan Peterson. I thought, well, what's who's Jordan Peterson and what's going on with him? And that's when, okay, and Rod Dreher then starts talking about Jordan Peterson. And, and then his biblical series starts, and it's like, what is this? So then I, and I found it just fascinating and interesting and and exhilarating i 
you know, before I sort of had the the methadone of Jordan Peterson for naturalism, <laughs> I had the methadone of 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 C.S. Lewis's miracles. Mm-hmm. And so I had been, how was I keeping my faith? Well, mm. it was Tim Keller. And of course, Tim Keller was downstream from C.S. Lewis. Tim Keller was a big Tolkien and Lewis fan. And so I read Miracles probably the first for the first time in maybe 2014 mm. or 2015, really read it and thought, oh, this is really helpful. So then I found myself either rereading it or re-listening to the audiobook like every six months. Wow. Because I was I was dealing with my own questions. Because as a minister, on one hand, you're you're talking to everyday people, but you're also dealing with the kinds of conflicts that modernity raised in the text. And for the last hundred years within, let's say, evangelicalism, there's been this constant battle between modernism and fundamentalism, and evangelicalism was kind of the boundary waters. And so usually you had a lot of English evangelicals, you know, N.T. Wright, uh, I. Howard Marshall. Alistair McGrath. Alistair McGrath. Um and, and all of, you know, New Testament scholars, Old Testament scholars. And so I had been, you know, all along reading, you know, Brevard Childs. I, I'd been doing all of this work sort of in moderate evangelical land. And in terms of social issues, I was a progressive by virtue of growing up at a racial reconciliation church during the civil rights movement, which in the denomination had always placed me on the side of Pro women in office, voting for the Democratic Party, uh, being out there in terms of racial reconciliation, all of these things. And then in the early 20 teens, I began noticing some really interesting things happening, usually around the uh, the sexual or gender liberation issues. And I began at that point sort of noticing sort of where, let's say, gospel liberation and liberationism mm. started to sort of pull apart. And, and that's where I kind of had, that's suddenly where I had to deal with it with myself. Was I, was I going to continue along the pathway of becoming fully liberationist? And, and part of that for me was sort of trying to figure out what's going on here. And that's where I came up with a lot of the language that will eventually appear in my videos in terms of progressive liberationism, because I'm watching friends and colleagues who are in my tribe in the CRC, just continuing down this route. And, you know, I had plenty of LGBTQ friends, plenty of kids around I'm living in Northern California, but unlike, let's say, I think places in Western Michigan, where they just sort of saw the beginning of it, I was seeing the full fruit of this. And I was watching young people change their pronouns and change their names and experimenting with these things. And I'm watching this and I'm beginning to say, this this doesn't look productive. This, I, I have a suspicion that this is all going to be in the long run, probably destabilizing. And I'm hard pressed to see that this is going to produce the kind of fruit that their liberation is is sort of promising or trying to anticipate. I imagine that these kids are going to go from gender curious to gender whatever. And then I start hearing stories from some of these kids that, well, there was a suicide attempt. And 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 this is in a place not where sort of the sort of the the stereotype says, Oh, well, that's because they're surrounded by non-affirming people. No, they're surrounded by the most imaginably affirming audience whatsoever, and they're still deeply unstable. And then I see things happening in the racial discourse, which, you know, then, and of course, much later on, you see George Floyd and this defund the police, and it's like, wait a minute. My whole life, I've been seeing black matriarchs crying for more police presence in their neighborhood. And now these people are saying, keep the cops out. And I'm thinking, 
And, and it's the white people saying, keep the cops out. And it's the black folks saying this. And the black folks are saying, listen to black voices. And it's like, I have been all my life, but you're mm. not saying what they're saying. Wow. <laughs> and because all of my experience had been with black voices, not with white people sort of mimicking or or newer black voices that were saying, no, we're the old, you know, this. So then this gen, I mean, I'm watching all of this stuff come apart and saying, what is happening? And so Jordan Peterson begins, I think, to add some pieces to the puzzle. You were watching. Now, I don't think, you were watching psych, a psychological event, right? And he, and then up pops a psychologist. Yeah, that's true. That's very true. And so I'm watching all of this, and I'm thinking, huh, huh, what is going on? And and so there's that issue. And then there's also sort of the. I, I'd often phrase it like, you know, so as as a local preacher, you're always having to deal with the questions of the text and the audience. And one of the things I learned very early on in seminary was, so you get to seminary and you sort of have the promise of all of this esoteric knowledge about scripture and you're going to learn Greek and Hebrew and you're going to read fancy commentaries and you're going to learn about the um, historical critical method and you're going to learn what textual criticism is and you're going to learn what higher criticism is and you're going to do all of this stuff. And the more I read these new commentaries, the less helpful I find them to be for everyday people. <laughs> I mean, Somebody, somebody who's just trying to make work, life work doesn't care whether this passage in the text comes from the J or the P source, you know, the sources. It's like, what, who are you talking to? And, and this, see, actually my little subculture in the Christian Reformed Church had been fairly well versed in this mm -hmm. because a lot of people, or, or two lights in my tradition, Kuiper and Bavink, had had this experience, you know, a few generations before, where, for example, Kuiper, smart student, goes to theological seminary in the Netherlands and becomes well versed in late late nineteenth century higher criticism and all of those issues. And then, because the the ecclesiastical tradition is okay, you get all of this education, and now you have to go. Now, the next step isn't, oh, you just leap to a seminary. That would be the worst thing for you. Now you actually have to go to what would be a starter church. Mm -hmm. And what the starter church is, is a small, often rural congregation with farmers and laborers. And you leave this ivory tower, and now suddenly you have to deliver sermons to regular people. And what Abraham Kuyper, what happens to him is he goes there and he discovers that the saints in the church, now every church is going to be a motley, and this is terribly non-Protestant of me, but a motley jumble of saints and sinners. <laughs> and you discover that the saints in the church aren't saints because they've somehow imbibed in all of this higher criticism. Right. They're saints because they have learned a whole bunch of things that they don't teach in seminary. Wisdom. <laughs> Wisdom and, and patience and things that look a lot more like the fruit of the spirit than the fruit of eight years of, of highfalutin education. And so what happens to Abraham Kuyper is a crisis in his faith in higher criticism and a beginning of trying to learn the wisdom of the church that has been present for centuries among the Klein La the the little people, the Klein Leiden in Dutch, the little people in the church that have actually managed to continue a tradition of wisdom and faith and something that is actually tremendously productive, unlike the geldings of the of of the ivory tower institution. So could could I pause you there? Yeah, because I think I that's, mean, a, that's you know, I'll just keep talking. <laughs> because that's that's actually an interesting point. It's something I've been hitting on in certain conversations. Um, you know, when I, when I was in high school, uh, had a youth intern at our church introduce us to Dallas Willard. When I went to do my undergrad, our ministerial orientation class, we opened up with Richard Foster and I thought these things were a total drag. <laughs> 
And now I'm 40 and, you know, uh, two months ago, whenever, actually my, my wife will get upset. I'm 39. And <laughs> I just turned 30. Well, a few months ago when uh, uh, John Mark Comer is, is bringing up this dialogue. And this is all, those people for me are evangelicalism. I'm very much been steeped in that. And there seems to be a disconnect. Like you, like you take eight years of propositional knowing and understanding, but, but in the, the life, in the liturgy of life, that's where the, that's where the wisdom is gained. And those arguments are important for certain personality types. And obviously that seems to make sense. If you're an academic, you're going to like keep pointing at these ideas. Um, but it's, and, and it, so even in my undergrad, they gave us a little taste of spiritual practice and discipline, you know, but it's, it seems like it's that maybe where like the kind of the monastery or something puts those things together. And, um, and our culture is so devoid and that's a big part of this conversation. I don't, that's what I'm hearing. That's what I'm hearing. I don't, I don't know if I'd say the monastery and I don't sure. say that, you know, so I've just been, you know, on the way over here, which is only three minutes, you know, I, I sort of, I, I listen to things in little bits because that's sometimes the only little snippets I got, you know, I'm listening to uh, Tom Holland um, go into Martin the Luther. life of Martin Luther. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, the monasteries come apart because of a whole variety of reasons, but they only come apart in certain places of Europe. So while I'm listening to Tom Harlan do Martin Luther, I'm also reading Carlos Erie's treatment of Teresa of Avila, who who is very annoyed at the fact that Jesus keeps bringing her into the sky and making her shine like the sun. And, and many of the monastics around her are suspicious that this is devilry at work. So, uh -huh. I mean, the world is enormously complex and confusing. Yeah. But it's, well, for me, because I'm a third generation minister, and what I had what I had learned from seeing my grandfather and my father in local churches was something similar along the lines of what Abraham Kuyper learned when he goes into his first church. That there is there is foolishness, there is silliness, there is banality, there is carnality. But there is also wisdom and beauty and life and joy in the local church. It is, it is, you know, as Nadia Boltz Weber says, it is saints and sinners. That's what it is mm -hmm. in a local church. And usually the it is the saints that are most aware of their sinfulness, and it is the sinners that are least aware. So, <laughs> but it's and, and so then when of course I I start making videos about Jordan Peterson, and then you know, people start coming out of the woodwork. And wanting to talk to me. And Jordan Peterson had been doing a little bit of this early on, but yeah. I I wasn't on the status rocket that he was on. And I'm a, I've got a small church, which depending on whether or not there's a crisis in someone's life at the moment, either affords me a little extra time, which has been glorious because it afforded me time to read, time to work on denominational things, time to work on bigger mission projects, all kinds of things. Well, then it afforded me the time to to talk to random people on the internet. And that then became a thing. And so here we are. Here we are. And it, it, so the people that, that are downstream from this and, and it's, I've, I find myself, I've, I've always found myself in some kind of liminal world. When I was 16, a church asked me to help start do the, the modern worship thing, but I was going to first Baptist, but this was an interdenominational church and I was doing both. I was going to youth group at my home church so I was all, I, I've been in this space. So I end up at that church. It's in between. Um, I, the pastor that I ended up being most formed under, he had gone to, he, he was from Long Beach. He, had, he went to UCLA, got a history degree. Then he went to Yale, got a divinity degree. And then he interned with Tim Keller and he was PCA. And that's who was most formative for me when I was on staff with him. And we're at it, but he decided not to, the, our church was not Presbyterian. Um, he came cause it, it had some other values culturally. He thought it was aimed at evangelistically. That was interesting to him. Um, he's about 10 years older than me. So, but I've been all this time, I've been a, not a theologian. I got a biblical studies degree, but I like the music. I like, uh, not a preacher, but a practitioner of, of, of worship 
very often. And so like in this in between, not one or, you know, the other very synthetic that way. And, and I think with the Peterson stuff, I mean, there was still this part of me, this academic part of me with new atheism. And maybe that's some of my age getting into YouTube early as a, when in my mid to late twenties, when that was all rolling around, lots of debates and apologetics and all that stuff. Um, but I was also had my own personal faith crisis and we've unpacked that and I've unpacked that on this channel enough at some, but like, um, that's where it seems like the people that are running into it is this like cerebral faith, but they're, but, but at the same time, our culture is also looking for a, a tangible or a sacramental faith at the same time, because it's like both of these things were just, you know, happening. I mean, both were devolving at the same time. And the thing, the interesting thing I heard, you, I, I was watching your, your video this morning and you kind of, well, there's a lot going on with Peterson in the last couple of weeks, ever since the Robert Barron video, um, and then he did, uh, he did Ian McGilchrist yesterday and he, uh, the one you were doing with the uh, Schallenberger was that part. Blew, I saw your tweet and I followed that part and I was like, oh my gosh, it's yeah. kind of some, his, he's letting out his, uh, yeah. his book to, to yeah, come out. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I just think that the, the Martin Luther thing, I, the, I'm, I'm, I'm going to listen to, to Holland's, uh, podcast on that because i did a study with my father-in-law several years ago who was lutheran for about 25 years and he we did a martin luther greatest courses together but it's been a long time and i was actually in that with a catholic friend and some baptist people and some other people the what i'm trying to get to paul is the propositions as a baptist person and then a presbyterian person when people would when I would see people quoting on Twitter or at the church, at the Baptist church down the street, and they would quote Augustine, they would quote C.S. Lewis, they would clo they would quote um, even Keller, or, and I would always think like, well, you know, they practice infant baptism. Do you know that they that they, you know, believe in some kind of real presence in their in their, uh, and yet here you are quoting their stuff, and and I, as I've come to this point now, because even Martin Luther, when he gave his solas, it was wrapped in the mass. And now when you take the solos and you put them and, you know, when um, Gavin Ortland's talking to Father Stephen a few weeks ago and he's trying to defend the solos, he's defending a completely different ontology. And that's where I'm finding I'm trying to understand and grow. I don't know. How does that hit you? Well, so looking around for. So part of what happened. Oh, it's over there. Part of what happened on my because my channel got at least a degree of visibility and then people start sending me books and I got piles of books. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not like my office needs more of them. Um, Kindle version preferred. Thank you. The pub publisher sent me the paper <laughs> ones. Um, so someone's, so Brett Sockold, uh, a Catholic theologian in Regina, Saskatchewan, his grandma or his mom starts watching me how this happens i don't know probably downstream of jordan peterson and bishop Barron, and says you should send him your book and so i get this book about transubstantiation and it's like what's this about so i start thumbing through it and his thesis was basically luther what luther wound up doing is sort of approximating what aquinas intended to do but the context around Luther had changed enough that he was misreading Aquinas and Aristotle. That was the other thing I wanted to hit is that he didn't have a hive mind. Well, yeah, I, you, you, well, he did, but it was a monastic one. Well, okay, yeah, and it was and it was limited, which may or may not help. So, this this question that you raised, that the. Okay, so these these solas that arise that are really more slogans than doctrines. It's really hard to fit a doctrine into two words. And all of the words being the same between all of the other. That's not really a doctrine. It's much more of a posture. And I think that's the best way to understand them as a posture. And I think actually Gavin Ortland sort of makes an argument for that. But the the argument then it's very different from the argument today because the cultures have changed dramatically and the contexts have changed dramatically. So, and, and which, which basically says you're probably better off with a posture 
because at least a posture is something that is contextual. A posture is within Verveke's other three Ps as much as it's propositional. Because a posture understands that a posture is always in relationship with something else. So, and what, and that's one of the things that I remember being in seminary reading for the first over for the first time the Christian Reformed Church order. And I remember it's not a long document. It's not terribly juicy to read. I work from it now quite often as a synodical deputy. But the when I first read that document, I thought, wow. This document is to ensure doctrinal is to ensure doctrinal succession in an institution. That is what this thing is pointed to. Yet everybody knows that, well, the, the number one thing Christian ministers tend to get fired for is not doctrinal. <laughs> it's behavioral. <laughs> it's behavioral. And you know, I've never I've never seen a defense of let's say a minister who's you know, I'm gonna say sleeps with the organist because it's safe today, because most of the churches that you and I deal with don't have organs. Um <laughs> never I've never seen a case that the minister who sleeps with the organist defends himself by saying, but I am doctrinally pure. And all of those things sort of came under the church order as conduct unbefitting. And it's like that's community standard. And I'm not arguing that churches shouldn't discipline their clergy for moral behavior. I'm saying the system doesn't fit the language. And in fact, the, the system is smarter than the language. And so the language is helpful and functional, but the system actually has within it a bunch of ways that it cheats on the language and everybody knows it and does it and rightly so, as well they should, because everyone is smarter than even the language and the system. And, you know, one of the things I bumped into in my classes was classes is sort of this regional judiciary. Like a presbytery. Right. Yeah. It's like the it's like the session. Mm -hmm. Or the pres I don't remember. The Presbyterians have different language. Anyway. Um, so I remember in ours, in our in our rules in our classes, they had one rule said that said weighty one rule says weighty decisions must be ratified by a two-thirds vote oh and then the, and then another rule is any rule in this book can be set aside with a majority vote and it's like so you could set aside the weighty no lawyer looked this up because you can set aside the weighty rule by a majority vote, thus making the weighty rule null and void. But the truth is, every functional classist understands how to work the language and the system because then they all have a sense of it. Oh, this should probably be a two thirds vote because this is really going to be significant. In other well, words, that, that goes into uh, the hierarchy of value, meaning that Peterson is just talking to. The, I'm a, I'm mapping that onto worship, but you're talking about it like because it, it makes sense if it fits this, you know, this fits here, this fits here. Like exactly. It, it, that's exactly right. And so the church is smarter than its rules or even often its doctrine. But yet the church needs to be submitting to something. And so in a Protestant way, you submit to scripture and you submit to the confessions, which are themselves submitted and revisable to scripture. And very early on, I also saw that whole idea of the confessions being revisable just hadn't really happened in 500 years or 400 years, if you want to include the, the, the canons of door in our system. So there are lots, of, and I just notice all of these inconsistencies. And I don't, I'm not offended by them. I'm not bothered by them, but I'm made curious by them. And for me, that says, ah, and that curiosity is sort of the, the seedbed of wisdom. Not to necessarily, oh, we have to destroy this system because these rules don't make sense. No, maybe maybe the rules actually do make some sense, but understand the sense that the rules are trying to serve. And then suddenly the system has a chance of working reasonably well, but will never work perfectly because we live in this world and we are such. My question so. is to that is, with like the mode of worship, though, that's kind of 
part of what I'm talking about here is those rules, propositions, confessions, um, also being placed where there's, like you're saying, like if everything is fitting into a hierarchy of importance, of, of um, authority, and uh, how we how we operate even in like our worship services maybe should orient something like that in an embodied sense. Yes. And I don't, I'm not like, at least from where I come from, it doesn't seem like that's congruent, I guess. It seems like it would make more sense if there was more of a, well, you could put it this way. Cause even though I was a part of this kind of Calvinist church for a long time, even the altar call, say the altar call is the is the highest point. That's still like a it's still like a you decision versus if the highest point is something like you know, um, a high view Eucharist. Of, of Eucharist. Yeah, yeah. I'm just those. That's what I'm trying to understand because I think that what I what I see in this space is and in that modern space of the the confessions and the propositions, like they are kind of forming something real that you're talking about. But then like an embodied way of kind of seeing that and it not just be I'm seeing confusion in this also because it's like, well, when you secularize worship, it kind of it also disrupts a hierarchy value of meaning. And what is the value of meaning is actually what what is secular. And so I don't know. I just feel like these things fit together, that the practice of worship um, and that's why I think this whole orthodoxy thing is bubbling up so hard. And 10 years ago, it was Catholic, though. I mean, that was everyone was becoming Catholic seven or eight years ago. Do you remember that season? And Anglican. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> so I don't know. I, I feel like that's what it's, what it's aiming at. That's, that's the impulse is there. Well, premise one, we are small, frightened, short-lived, vulnerable creatures. Mm -hmm. Let's start there. <laughs> And small, frightened, short-lived, vulnerable creatures are really hungry for things like certainty yeah. and clarity. Mm -hmm. Certain things within the matrix of the Christianity and the Christian church afford moments of heightened clarity and power. It's not arbitrary that in an evangelical in certain kinds of evangelical churches the moment the sacramental moment is the altar call because it's that experience of the the moment of transformation of a of a of an initiation it isn't arbitrary or incidental that in you know, again, just thinking about the, the Roman Catholic Church 500 years ago, you can't let regular people partake of the cup. And the priest should have his back to the congregation. Because this is this is the this is the holy moment that needs to be guarded. Why is it in a good old evangelical altar altar call, every eye closed? Why every eye closed? Every eye closed is synonymous to the back of the priest. Mm. It's that holy thing. Personal sacred moment. Yep, it's a personal sacred moment. Now, if everybody's just peeping so that they can <laughs> gossip after church about <laughs> every week Susie's this hand. guy gives up for the <laughs> altar call. Every freaking week. How many times can this guy get saved? Yeah. Now, pastorally, you say, you know, he's a Martin Luther. He's got a weak conscience. He, mm. he, he feels things deeply and, and he's just hungering for more of God. So, and that's why they say every eye closed because don't gossip about this guy. He has something the rest of you should want to have, which is he has a hunger and desire for more of God, or maybe he's just neurotic, you know, or <laughs> maybe he's, or both. maybe he's performing or maybe he's performing yeah. except in most Baptist churches, you don't necessarily gain status by mm. well maybe in some well it's like in the <laughs> look Christian how holy church. look how holy that guy is man yeah, he, he yeah. really is close to god down there people people are people 
endless are endless game players and it doesn't matter what thing is most holy or salient to a community there will be gaming around it, it it's always the case and so they'll be gaming around the eucharist they'll be gaming around the liturgy they'll be gaming around the conversion they'll be gaming around yeah. the estuary they'll be gaming around any status hierarchy that's created and status hierarchies create themselves at an instance and so there will always be gaming so and I think that the the curious part of me, because I've never really, I've been to a handful of mass, uh, but is that the, what's, I guess what I, the way that this is, this is all piecing back to what Peterson did is that it's causing me to psychologically look at worship and like psychologically <laughs> and, and synth, synth, spiritually. Yeah, it it a very real because okay, I because I did this, I I planned this thing for fifteen years, planned this thing, planned this thing, planned this thing, planned this thing, and and I, you know, I'm psychologically thinking, well, what does it mean when I'm the guy up there during the altar call, and I look down, and at my feet is somebody kneeling down in prayer. What is that doing psychologically? Like they're it's almost like they're kneeling down to me. Um. And then, and you know, I think everything can be abused. You could abuse Eucharistic practice in some ways, I'm sure. It's just, when I think about at the very end of that moment, when, when the priest actually does administer that, that he's giving you something that's not him. At the very end of it, it's something, and it's, re, and it's something you can touch. And so I, th I just think about that psychologically. I'm not sure where I land theologically. You know, I don't have certainty about a lot of things, but yeah. I guess that's what, I, that's what I've been evaluating. I don't know. I wanted to put it out there to Paul Vanderclay. <laughs> well, I think there's a, there's a... Every system has its temptations. So in a, in a, in a system of priests... Now, I'm being very deliberate about the difference between a priest and a minister. Yeah. Because priests are intermediate. I, mean, I was talking to Father Eric one time, and I was saying, you know, the whole question of women in office is very different in Protestant churches than Catholic churches. When I say that, people often, quite understandably, don't understand what I'm seeing when I say it. Well, nice and and Father Eric got it me and said, yeah, we, make, we can make holy water. We make sacred oil. We make... You know, because a priest, you have this entire system that says, here these people are set apart. Now, we do some setting apart in Protestant land. We're not fully deconstructed Catholics, really. And when you get back into, like, the normal people, I mean, I remember going to the Dominican Republic, you know, preaching the priesthood of all believers, and all of the people were saying, bullshit. Mm. no. You are the missionary. You're mm -hmm. here. We're the pastor. We're here. We derive our authority yes. from you and our status from you. And then we then because of that, we get authority and status from the people. I didn't understand that. I'm just a pup in his 20s saying, no, I went to seminary. It's the priesthood of all believers. We're all equal. And the Haitians are like, you're so full of shit. But <laughs> I, we don't really care anything you say. The, the most important thing is that you're here, and so we're going to set you up into the front of the church, and we're going to demonstrate to the entire community that we have a relationship with you. And that has religious, it has political, it has economic, it has all of those things. So in some ways, the Roman Catholic priest is as a liability because they are a priest and not just a minister or a pastor. So they have that vulnerability, but they have a different sort of um, a different sort of protection because you're exactly right. They're not, the thing isn't the great sermon. There are plenty of things I'm sure that any, that priests can gain status by yeah. in their own hierarchies. Yep. And in fact, they have a hierarchy uh, in the Christian form church. There are no bishops. And so we're all ministers of the word. But if you're a man, if you're an evangelical minister and you know, you're preaching sermons and people are in tears and your church is growing, Oh, that's dangerous business. And worship leaders are almost worse because <laughs> the truth the truth is the worship leaders will bring the feels a lot more reliably usually than the preacher. Mm. And the the best thing, you know, one of the great one of the, one of God's greatest blessings to me has has been my failures. Mm. That I, you know, Someone will come around and well, it's all relative too, because somebody might say, well, you get to have a building. 
Yeah, but I didn't build it. The community built it 60 years ago. I just inherited it because they need, needed some guy to come in and do the thing. But I'm, and that's why I'm glad that, you know, I haven't broken 30 yet and 30,000 subs yet. And I'm glad I don't have a hundred. I thought, I'm glad I don't have a little, that little YouTube plaque behind, you know, with kind of the, <laughs> the thing that, that a lot of people, and Peugeot doesn't put his up and neither does Verveke. <laughs> Good on them. They're smart guys. But, you know, everybody's, like, oh, look, here's my, here's, this is what I got from YouTube because anybody, anybody can have a YouTube channel, but only the, the hierarchies get the, and on and on and on and on. So, Every, all of these successes are potential spiritual liabilities. And you know that because you start, you start, you know, yeah, so you're a great worship leader and everybody is in tears and they're all just, you know, and, and now, you know, maybe you have multiple worship services and then, you know, there's always somebody in the church that's going to come up to you and say, worship um, was great today, Christian. Yeah. Christian. You know, I, all the other worship lead, worship here is always good. But it's just a little better when you're doing it. Really, yep. really, yeah. really. So you, you really got to be on uh, careful of that. And every system is going to have their own hierarchies and their own status engines for this. So with that, like if it's inevitable, why the complaint that something like the the Catholics make it so transparent that it's real I'm not, I'm not sure what you're saying well i mean the critique that there's there's bishops and that there's archbishops and there's oh. a pope and all that kind of stuff if it's real if it's real if 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 the hierarchies are real because we're i mean that's what it sounds yeah. like we're saying is that they are real yeah that, well well they're I, they're they're overt and they're visible like everybody knows you get a group of evangelical pastors together Who's got Everybody the biggest knows church? The hierarchies, the one with the biggest church, <laughs> yeah. the one with the most staff, the mm -hmm. one with the prettiest buildings, mm -hmm. the one who actually wrote a book and nobody else did and had it published, the one whose books actually sold. They're the even, you know, they're the even stranger ones, not the ones who, because they have a mega church, they managed to sell all of those copies to all of the people in their church plus their mom. Um, I mean, I mean hierarchies always develop we cannot and the reason hierarchies develop again this is what you get from peterson or berveke the reason hierarchies develop is because of combinatorial explosiveness you Can't have to know where to pay attention and so whether or not you want hierarchies to develop they will and you have to deal with them now you can make them overt or you can make them implicit and the truth is that modernity makes some things overt and some things implicit, and tradition makes some things overt and some things implicit. But you've always got to deal with all of it in either way. And every different approach has its own, it's always trade-offs, has its own strengths and weaknesses. And so, and, and at some point, because there are hierarchies and because life demands choice, you have to choose what to do with the hierarchies that you've been given. Or you yeah. can switch to a different set of hierarchies. That's fine. But, you know, so I was, you know, again, just Tom Holland and one of the biggest, you know, one of the biggest media blitzes brandings that ever went out was the anti-papal brandings where, you know, what they did was say, here's the life of Jesus. This is the life of the Pope. How's that look? And that continues today. Yeah. You know, the Pope lives in a palace. Jesus says, you know, you know, birds have nests, foxes have dens, but the I Son don't. of Man has no place to lay his head. And so then, okay, well, we're going to have a humble apartment for the Pope. But the Pope can't really have a humble apartment because he's in charge of an enormous institution, and neither can the senior pastor. So all of these tensions exist. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's complicated, and and I mean you and I mean you're you're I think it's you're trying to contend with that. You are contending with that. You have been contending with that. I think. Yeah, yeah. You always you always do, and um, again, I I mean people. I'm I'm glad my channel isn't larger than it is. 
at the same time, part of me wants it to grow. Part, part of me would be thrilled if some video I made went viral and I jumped from 30 to 100,000 subs in three months. Part of mm. me would be thrilled by that. And I can Not translate me. that different ways. Not me. I wouldn't be thrilled. Yeah, 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 right. <laughs> um, I don't believe any of that bullshit. Um, uh, I, know, I know what human beings are. But that's and right. again, if and so then to me, it's just like, well, if 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 God would give that to me, then I would have to accept that challenge. Yeah. And I would have to figure out then how to operate in a different context. But well, I'm quite happy. I'm quite happy with the fact that I have time to talk to you in this way. And, and that's that's what I've I mean I I'm following an example. Like I mean you are the biggest channel I've talked to by far but that I've talked to people that said hey I went to this thing and Christian Baxter was at Symbolic World and it looked like he was connected and he just started a video I had like two subs and I was like let's talk. That would, it, I'm not doing that because that's an original idea. No. And so that leads me to the point of the quote that you said, I want to change YouTube a few weeks ago. I do. I'd love to change you. Well, actually, YouTube, I think what we are doing with YouTube is actually what YouTube should be about and to a degree aspires to be about. But, you know, if you look at some of these videos out there on the history of YouTube, you know, what happened with YouTube was eminently predictable. and. But I, that's why I love small channels and creators of small channels who are doing what, like what you're doing. Now, here's the problem. I can only, because of my, because of combinatorial explosiveness and my mm -hmm. limits of time and space, I can only bless so many small channels and I have favorites too. And yeah. then people get offended when I have favorites and it's not them. And but that's just natural too. So yeah. That's all the, of this stuff happens. Yeah, that's the uh, that's the little bit of the the rub that I guess when I I, I did released a podcast with Luke Thompson uh, yesterday, and this was a part of our conversation was just like, well, I was pushing back on him that it's like I'm going to fight this, I'm going to fight this, I'm gonna, but like some of it you need to accept. It's almost like dealing with the shadow of yourself or something, you know? Like, um, but yeah, I, one of the I was kind of hitting on this earlier, but. What do you think about the term psychological Christianity? This just kind of came to my mind with this whole Peterson thing. I mean. Huh. I don't know what it means yet. I just I had, made it up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because, because of course, Richard Dawkins is out there saying, okay, well, there's cultural Christianity and those who believe it. And I like that Glenn Scrivener just did a great video on that. It's like, I like the fruits of, I like the fruits of cultural Christianity and Glenn Scrivener's like, yeah, but you don't get that if nobody believes it. The only reason you get all those cathedrals and all those things that, that Richard Dawkins for the last 20 years has been saying, everyone should read the King James Bible. Mm -hmm. just, just be really careful with it that you don't start believing this stuff. It's like, you should probably put a different book in their hand if you don't want people to believe because that book has a track record, buddy. Yeah, exactly. That book has a serious track record. <laughs> And it's not what you want. <laughs> so it's just funny. It's just funny how we are. Yeah, um, I, I think there's just this cycle. Well, you know, Peterson being asked, you know, years ago now, uh, do you believe in the literal resurrection? And he's like, depends on what you mean by believe. And, you know, we toss that around a lot in this space. The literal and, resurrection or the physical resurrection? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I don't remember. Which, what did he, was that? It was Dillahunt, wasn't it? I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure they said literal, but, well, he should have said, well, I don't physical. know, is it written down? No, it's literally written down, yes. It's literal. It's right there in the book. <laughs> uh, was it physical? I think, so. well, what do you mean by physical? Okay, so, regardless, I think that that has created a psychological Christianity, it, it, even for me, in a way. Like, I mean, where I don't need certainty to believe that this is true. Well, this is the trick of the word believe, because of course, you probably know enough Greek to know it's pistis. <laughs> well, it's been a, been a long time. Yeah. That sounds about pistis, right. Which is either translated believe or have faith. Because, and then if you read... Epistemology. And if you, then if you read Hebrews 11, well, we, we have faith for things that we don't quite we're not quite certain about. And so we hope for that's right. 
And, and so there's a tension there. And now, of course, the new atheists go and say, well, faith is something that you believe without evidence. It's like, no, that's not exactly right either. But right there in the word, there's this tension. You know, um, man brings man. So the guy, Jesus goes up, transfiguration, Peter, James, John comes down. The rest of the disciples are down there fumbling with this boy who's possessed by a spirit. And, you know, you know, can you make him? Well, can I? Do you believe? Oh, I believe, I believe. It's like, <laughs> well, you didn't a minute ago and now you do. Now it's perfunctory. Don't worry about it. But Jesus made his point. <laughs> Jesus made his point that, that that faith. And now, again, what we've sort of taken from this is often sort of a, a screwing up a construal, you know, like Dumbo's feather. No, it's not. It's not so much the my capacity to to put on blinkers to doubts. It's my willingness to live in faithfulness. And and again, you can take that, you know, so okay, so Jehovah's Witnesses don't do blood transfusions because they really believe that life is in the blood. And I mean, again, once you have a hierarchy, it will be gamed. And same with any faith hierarchy. But the but that doesn't mean we don't know what he's talking about. It's just it's really hard to live sometimes. Yeah, just it like is. the disciples. You know, it's Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is praying up blood. <laughs> His disciples are snoring away. I'd be there sleeping. I know I would. I mean, it's just how I am. It's how we are. Yeah, there's also nothing wrong. I mean, even they, as the Gospels write about uh, Peter or Jesus' favorite, and then James, and then John or Peter and James, and I mean that there was a natural hierarchy in in, in his relationships, and that happens yeah. in all of that should happen in all of our lives that we have a best friend or yeah. something, you know, like I think you know. So on one hand, God gets to have favorites, and on the other hand, God is no, um, you know, God has no favorites. Both things are said in Scripture. That's and, the but they're saying competitive points. Mm -hmm. It's like a Gordon Hall talks about like a non competitive something or another versus like a zero sum game. Yeah. I, um, let's see here. So you've hit before on kind of probably you had some big critiques maybe during the 90s and the aughts with the church growth movement, and you went to Willow Creek and uh, back. I went to both. You were just, yeah, that was a little closer, wasn't it? Uh, and kind of were evaluating that. And, and I was into that whole movement from the beginning. I was, uh, I turned, you know, 15 in the year 2000. So, you know, like, and I was very tapped in. My life was, I was already listening to only Christian music. That was kind of rock music in the 90s. That's all my parents would let us listen to. So it was a pretty natural thing for this whole modern worship thing to really, work for me. It was like, well, I can do something in this. And, and, uh, but you know, with that whole movement, and then you talk about being a pastor at a small church during this time, um, like what, what were, what were your biggest grievances and frustrations with, with that movement as we see it start to, you know, with the rise and fall of Mars Hill and all these pastors collapsing and, and all that stuff. So what, um, I don't know what is your what is your big perspective on all that? I I don't have I, I see it like I see just about everything, I suppose. Uh <laughs> shades of gray. Yeah. There's some really powerful good things about it. I think a lot of people I'm just gonna say it this way, a lot of people were saved. And I mean that their their life was rescued, their their life was better, their marriages were better, their finances were better, their children were better. Um they they have assurance of eternal life in Christ. I mean, saved all the way up and down the stack. And but yet that movement, like every movement, had its strengths and its blind spots. It it was a very Protestant movement in that it was highly mercenary and and could be quite dismissive of tradition. And you do dismiss tradition at your peril, but the difference between respecting tradition and becoming a traditionalist or traditionalism is important too. So it's not surprising that the 
the seeker movement would eventually yield something like Dallas Willard, which was a return to the tradition. I mean, you just keep swinging back as human beings. We're always trying to, we, we never get it right. We're always compensating one way or another. So, or then if, obviously if you're in the middle, you have the danger of being lukewarm. So that's the problem with the moderists. Um, so it was, I remember re- sitting at Saddleback on the lawn, looking over their big tents that they had, because of course the church grew too fast that they couldn't build a building. So they built big tents and et cetera, et cetera. And I was reading Eugene Peterson, which was sort of the other side of the conversation in evangelical land. Eugene Peterson that um, had some pretty pretty stark things to say about the triumphalism that the seeker movement was feeling in the 80s and 90s. But already in the late 90s, when I got back to North America, it was becoming increasingly evident that this was, this was a church growth strategy well-developed for subur- suburban boomers. It worked in other places too, but that was really the sweet spot of it. I read and- Blue Like Jazz. Uh, yeah, by Donald Miller, and he right. describes that specifically because he was an intern at Willow Creek. Yeah, and he describes that phenomenon specifically. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. And and so I mean, so the emergent movement. I, I remember going to the Axis service at Willow Creek because they said we have sociology, we have science, we have we have all of this stuff. We we basically studied the boomers and said, you know what, we can psychological Christianity. We can bring them in. We can, you know, we've got the fish processing ship here at Willow Creek and Saddleback. And we just bring them right in. And, you know, we're making fully devoted followers to Jesus Christ. We're we're a factory that does this. Oh, mm-hmm. but those Xers. Okay, so we're going to study them. And so we're going to adjust all of these little variables. And we'll have a factory that processors Xers. But they didn't realize is that, of course, the Xers, the, 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 the human capacity to game. It's like, I see all the tricks you're, you're, you know, you're playing on our parents and they ain't going to work on me because I can see through those tricks. Now, of course, generation to generation, you go through these things and things get forgotten. But so the, the whole Gen X, the old Gen X style, the axis or forget what the they, they had their own little church within a church and Dieter Zander, Zand, no, it wasn't Dieter Zander. It wasn't one of the Zander. It was a Zander that was doing it. And, you know, and like I Brian watched, McLaren. Yeah. Well, but the, it basically generated the emergent movement. And what was interesting about the emergent movement is it was so incredibly forked. It had Mark Driscoll, it had Rob Bell, and it had Nadia Boltz Weber. And both Driscoll and Bell plant churches called Mars Hill. Mm-hmm. But of course, Driscoll and Bell are going whoop. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, oh, oh, well, maybe we're not quite as smart as we thought. And then, of course, you have the, I forget what the name of the book is. I bought it where Willow Creek basically, again, they still, they continued to, they're the psychological church. They studied themselves and said, we're, we're kind of producing what any psychologist or sociologist would tell them they're producing, which is you're, you've developed a Skinner box to achieve a particular outcome and you've achieved it. Ah, but what we want is the genuine article. And that's where you get into Verveke and Sam Tiedman asking, well, is there something within humanity that can't quite be figured out and exhausted by science? You'd think Christians should have had that as part of their assumption to the beginning and said as, let's say, good Calvinists, which is how Bill Hybels was raised in a Christian Reformed church in Mesquite, in Kalamazoo, Michigan, that no, actually it's the, it's the, it's the work of the Holy Spirit, which is theologically in kind of a black box, which says you're never fully going to gain this. You might you might develop some really effective mission strategies to do some really good things. Praise God. God bless you. Work them. But have a little bit of humility that the people that you are processing in your fish plant are image bearers of God. And there is something in them that will both amaze you and perhaps cause you to despair over your fish factory. Yeah. And that would be 
all these new converts that aren't aren't getting involved in the mega church. That would that would be that would be Peter Kraft going, you know, growing up in I forget which reformed church in New Jersey. My father would often preach at that church, and then going to Calvin College and all of the philosophy, the 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 the, the, the shining star of Calvin's. Um, constellation, the philosophy department saying, this is going to be the next great philosopher. And then he goes and becomes a Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> or, or or Calvin Seminary decides, we want to do a PhD program. And then Nathan Jacobs, who's an artist, and he's smart, and he's cool. And he gets all tatted up and goes orthodox. Mm. It's like, if you're not ready for that, then you haven't really read the gospel because Jesus picks 12 and who sells them out? <laughs> the one that they let hold the money. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> so this is, it's all there in the story, but you can't wield the story. The story wields you. Now it doesn't mean you don't, you don't have any agency, but it does mean you'd better be, a little bit humble about the agency you possess. Mm. And that doesn't necessarily mean that God is not in charge. And it doesn't mean that we don't have questions about God's administration of the universe. Oh, heck yeah. And in fact, the people who are most Christian have the most questions and they feel them the most. The easiest way to get rid of that questions is to get rid of God. Well, the, 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 the universe doesn't seem to be managed the way I think it should. Therefore, there is no God. That's a cop out. You want to try something hard? Stay in relationship with that God, with the universe who is managing the universe you are disagreeing with. Then you sit in the seat of Job. Then you sit on the cross with Christ. Man, I got him preaching. Yeah, I got him preaching. preaching. Yeah. I, I listened to your sermon last week and I was like, man, he really is preaching. Like, <laughs> you, you're getting that preach on. <laughs> I am a preacher. I try yeah. to, you know, I, I try to cover it on my YouTube channel, you know, not being, you know, <laughs> Yeah, so I this talking about like we don't think that we have the corner on something um, with you know like the mega church movement and all that stuff. Uh, Everybody you, who's successful begins to be seduced by their success. Yeah. So what about the uh, well? What about these successful people that are? don't claim necessarily Christianity that are causing a Christian revival like uh, Holland and Peterson. Yeah. That's God's sense of humor. Yeah. And, and it's, but, but you know, isn't it always that way? Hmm. I mean, look at, again, look at the story of Luther. I mean, one of the, the first things that they do is they kick him out of the Augustinian order. It's the first thing that they do. Okay. So now he's outside. Is that really a good move? Is he really a Christian at that point? He, and then, and then he's got <laughs> you know, and then, and then the church basically, you know, then they excommunicate him, basically. Okay, well, and then they're going to kill him. Mm -hmm. And okay, is that really a good move? And so we're we're always dealing with mm. the fact that, again, I, I've said it many times. I have good friends and able preachers who are in the city of Toronto with plenty of empty seats in their churches. And Jordan Peter comes and fills the, this hall um, at, at 40 bucks a pop. I mean, if I charged 40 bucks a service here, you know, I don't get that many visitors. Um, maybe some of the randos would pay 40 bucks to come once, but they're not going to come every week. And, you know, I mean, churches just don't work like that. But Peterson does something that is completely unexpected and the church grows. Okay, so now, and and I, you know, I saw this happening. I said, I want to learn about this. I, I want to know what he's saying. I want to understand what he's doing. Maybe part of it because, well, if I can understand how he's doing, then I can learn from him and maybe I can do some of the same things. Maybe I can, because he is, in my opinion, helping people that I have been unable to help. Maybe there's something I can learn from him in order to help them. And I don't know how much I really learned from him in terms of order to help them. 
because most of what I've waded in here with is all the same pastoral skills that I learned from my father more than Jordan Peterson. What did you learn from him? My father from Peterson. Peterson. Well, I learned a lot of the propositional stuff that I can spout now. I, you know, learned about combinatorial explosiveness and I learned about why I had been feeling some of the stuff I had been feeling in terms of, you know, some of the stuff behind postmodernity. I learned a lot of psychology. Um, I, you know, learned a little bit about Jung. I learned, I mean, I've learned a lot of stuff from Peterson. It's the whole thing has been a learning thing for me, but then I also learned from Peugeot and I learned from mm-hmm. Verbeke and I learned from Grim Grizz and I learned from Chad. I mean, the, the real key to being a lifelong learner is to be able to learn from almost any anyone and anything, high or low status, happy or 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 something that you really don't want. If you can learn, if you can learn from disasters, well, that's those disasters are often the best places to learn from. A bridge collapses. Mm. There's a lot to learn there. There's more to learn from the bridge that collapses than all the bridges that are up. Yeah, that's true. I guess that may, when you said, uh, being the, the real learners are the ones that are willing to learn from anybody, no matter what. And that, that goes back to make me think about what Jordan Hall doing all the randos. Like he's not just, I mean, he's trying to learn something. Um, I think he's realized that, oh my goodness, there was, the world is just this way too, because again, combinatory explosiveness. He comes into the he comes into that little town and he looks around. And it's like, what, what, how are these people doing this? And they're doing it with stuff that he had just simply dismissed. And so now he's he realized he's a smart guy and he realized, oh, I have something to learn from these people. And he's also interested in this question of scale. And so I'm not surprised he's paying attention to the internet. Mm -hmm. And this is why I, I try to say as yes to as much as I can, because I, everywhere I go, I learn. Yeah. It was an interesting thing. I told you about that pastor that moved from Long Beach and then he went to Connecticut and then he comes to this town of 10,000 in Northeast Arkansas. And I asked him after he'd been there about a year, I said, um, what's the biggest difference, you know, coming into this rural town in Arkansas versus growing up in Orange County and Long Beach and church playing there and doing ministry at, in Connecticut, at, you know, Yale and stuff. And he was like, it's actually not as big a difference as I thought it was going to be. And, you know, our towns, it's, it's kind of unique. We have a a college that has like a 90 something percent acceptance rate in a med school. We have a community college. We have a healthcare center. We have some industry that's international. That's tiny. We're an hour and a half from Little Rock. We're two hours from Memphis. We're an hour and a half from the biggest other city, 60,000 people. So it's a weird little town. But uh, to that point, there is the, the internet is like a great leveler because he made the, he made mention. He's like, well, you know, we thought it would be a big deal to have to drive an hour and a half to go to a city. It's like, but you know, there's Amazon now. And then, you know, I'm, he's talking to smart political scientists at, and biologists that work at this college and, you know, physicians in town and whatever, and, uh, you know, smart business people. And, and I've always had this chip up on my shoulder from being from a small town because city, and Keller was kind of part of this in the Christian, you know, the city to city, you know, the, the, I don't know what you would call it, kind of the, um, don't, yeah, worship's a strong word of cities with that, you know, but there was a uh, a movement to really value you based on what city you were from. And that, that made me a little self-conscious going to some of the conferences with people like the Acts 29 and stuff. And they'd be like, oh, okay, Baxter, where are you from? I was like, oh, this little town in Arkansas. Like, All right, moving on. It's like you had, I mean, status, but there's like, because it wasn't attached to a city. And so I've you just- wanna found- be a, You want to be a successful minister and- <laughs> In New York or San Francisco or Los Angeles or, you know, even Memphis would be even better. Even Sacramento. <laughs> even Sacramento. Yeah, Memphis. Yeah, there's cities and stuff. And so it, that was an interesting thing. And to see somebody like Jordan Hall, Harvard-educated guy, you know, retired Silicon Valley guy, and he's like searching out these 100, you know, channel, 100 sub channels to have conversations. Like, what is going on? Like, Cause I mean, yeah, he's had a transformation in his life, but he hasn't just abandoned his brain. Like, right. 
there's something going on there. Yeah. And that's, and actually that's what you really look for because this is, this is why. So Jordan Hall could have conversations on bigger channels. There's no question about that. He has. Yeah. And he has. Um, but, this is also the reason why people are like, oh, you should reach out and talk to, you know, some high status person. And actually, I, I tend to find the, 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 rare ex, the rare times that I've actually done that, I kind of look back and it's like, that yeah, was fine. It was fun. But I have more fun doing what we're doing now. Because, and it's a little selfish of me because you've watched enough of my stuff that you actually have knowledge of who I am. Now I've now you've been on YouTube a little bit and I've watched enough of your stuff that I have an idea about who you are. So actually now that we both know each other a little bit, it's actually a lot more fun. <laughs> yeah. We have enough map territory of each other that we can actually sort of know what we want to find out from the other person. Whereas with with a high status person, like most of the times when I talk to complete randos, I have no idea who they are. They know me. And so that's why I spend the whole time trying to get to know who they are. That makes them more interesting one side, because you don't have to dig very deep in, in terms of a normal human being to find the uniqueness of their glory and their pain. Their tragedy or their hero's journey. Yeah, it's usually both. You don't have a hero's journey without a tragedy. Mm -hmm. But wherever they are on that, I guess. Yeah, 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 yeah. It is, it is, it has been interesting and, oh man, it, the, and it is like entering into a conversation and that was one of the interesting things about the, the symbolic world. There was, it was like a nexus and on so many levels for a lot of people, but, um, where you're, you know, I sat down and had a sandwich with Grim Grizz. Yeah, that was, how does that happen? I mean, like. It's not too hard if you're local. I mean, I always say that all the time. I mean, you want to shake my hand? Well, I'll tell you, at 9 o'clock on Sunday morning at Living Stones in Sacramento, you can shake my hand. Well, we'll but I'm, to talk. I guess what I'm saying is, how does that happen when you, like, you you didn't, I didn't know he existed three months ago. Right. That's the part that's like, and then all of a sudden there's actually some meaning here and there's like this, there's actually history because it's, you've all ingested this thing. And that's kind of like how I feel like a, so, so many people I've talked to, they've all gone to, you know, J cubed university, you know, John Peugeot and Jordan Peterson. They've, and, and, and -cubed university. Uh, <laughs> That's, I hadn't heard that one yet. Who said that somebody, I think it was mostly not working, put that on a comment and, <laughs> and they, you know, and then, he, and then, you know, you were talking about these college experiences, these seminary experiences, well, what happens when with YouTube when you give everybody a university, but you don't have a commons or a steady group to process all that stuff with? And and you you were like the professor that came out and sat with the students, you know, out in the at the cafeteria, you know, always appreciate the student center. And you know, I well, these people are trying to like put this stuff together, and because it's a, it's a, it's a huge amount of deep and weighty theological psychological spiritual you know information that people have taken in hundreds of hours you, like you have that has to move somewhere i mean you were doing it so it's like it was real natural for you and that's what preaching is is the synthesis but i think that it, it it's the same time it was hard to find conversation partners and it's just been beautiful to just jump in like i, I had an awesome conversation with kezi the other day just jumping in and like, well, let's tell, what's your Peterson story? Oh man, that's amazing. And, and just blah, 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 you know? And that is, um, that's been really, it's been really good for me. And, um, uh, I don't know. I had a question about, um, or I don't know if you wanted to say anything to that. Jason, well, yeah, I think that's part of, it's hard to find conversation partners in many ways. That's what this little corner is about. You want to find conversation partners? around J cubed university this is the place to do it. You will find conversation partners and there will be a diversity of conversation partners. There'll be, there'll be the ortho bros. There'll be the sort of Vervakian post Christian. And there'll be sort of the evangelical deconstructed, reconstructing Vander Clay group. 
that's basically what we've built. Yeah. And it, that's a good thing. It is. It's been, I think it's been healthy. I had a, con this guy, uh, he, he emailed me after I, I had that viral uh, Peterson thing that I released from Symbolic World. <laughs> I have since taken down. <laughs> have you, did, did anybody contact you? No, I just, uh, I just, it was, I, well, I let it go to 50, about 55,000 views. <laughs> and then uh, somebody posted like I think it was a girl I don't know who and she just lamb blasted me on a comment and I tried to get defensive and, and I was talking to my wife about well, it and what did she say she said you, yeah you this is how dare you how dare you this is this is Jonathan Peugeot's content and you know and, and how, how dare you you know this is his and I was like I paid for this ticket <laughs> she was like that's you know better than that and I was like well and then Grim Grizz actually mentioned it. It was like, what's Agent Baxter doing? You think he's like, uh, well, what's he doing with this? Or I don't know. He kind of called me out like he called you out the other day. And I was like, <laughs> and then I was talking to my wife about it. And, and so with those three strikes, I just kind of was like, okay, I'm pulling it now. And uh, that was probably best. Yeah. So <laughs> I think, I think the, I, I, I suspect at some point the symbolic world. Stuff. Yeah, they'll I hope they put it out on YouTube so that people, yeah. I think I, I completely understand and, and practice. I mean, I've got my little no wait, no ads shtick going. Um, I completely understand you've got a conference to pay for. And so keep it, keep it behind a paywall for a reasonable amount of time. But it's the whole idea behind uh, copyright. Keep it for a reasonable amount of time and then bless the world with it. Yeah, it's just that that timeline's so much shorter than copy. I don't know what the copyright laws are, 20 years wow, that's or something. Cause, that's because it got corrupted thanks to the mouse. <laughs> the, the mouse. mouse. <laughs> yeah. Can't, I mean, let, can't let Mickey fall out of copyright. Oh, I forgot that mouse. I thought you were talking about like this mouse. I was like. <laughs> no, 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 not that mouse. The mouse, Mickey Mouse. That's right. Mickey there was... Mouse is why copyright kept getting longer and longer because they don't didn't steal. want old Steamboat Willie. Mm. out there in the world, even though nobody made better use of public domain material than Walt Disney himself. I remember talking to someone, a big Disney fan, and she was saying, I think it would be terrible if Cinderella came out of copyright. It's like, Cinderella was a, long, a lot longer before Disney ever got his hands on it. Mm -hmm. Sure, give him time to make some money on it. That keeps people incentivized and motivated to build culture, but then bless the culture by putting it out into the world. Yeah. Because the truth is like with no eight, no ads, I feel bad about that sometimes, but it grew out of the fact that I'd, I'd have a conversation with you and it's probably might happen with you. I don't know when you're going to release this, but I have a conversation with someone and then I'm just talking to someone. So I talked to Jonathan. You talked to Jonathan. Yeah. Well, what did you say? Oh, I don't know. We talked about stuff. Well, can you show me the video? So well, I'm probably going to put it out next week because, you know, I kind of have a sense of when I want to put things out on the channel. Well, I want to see it right now. <laughs> so then you make a link for them and then, and then they see it. And then they, it's just like, all right, I'm going to game this system. There's no wait, no ads. You want to see it right now? There it is. You can watch it. $7 a month. There you go. That's YouTube gets a third. I don't care. Now you can see it. But yeah, that that's I mean, what's the future for Paul Vanderclay? What's the future? You're 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 sneaking up on the old big R, the big retirement. Yeah. I don't know. I, I you know, Pete, right away when I started this, people were like, well, what's your plan? I said, mm. I don't have one. I really don't. Now, I like doing what I do. Do I want to be able to keep doing what I do? Yeah, I probably want to keep enjoy like I, i'm probably gonna do what i do as long as i keep enjoying it now to the degree that i have financial need and it makes financial sense then suddenly you get motivated by that and i, I that's not necessarily a bad thing but you know if living stones were to fold you know then suddenly if, if my wife you know we get my you know, you know what small churches are like um my wife's health care as a public employee union in the state of California, as compared to what the Christian Reformed Church offers its minister, there's no comparison. No. And so, you know, we're, 
the smaller the church got, the more and more dependent we've been on my wife's employment. And um, so I don't know what's going to happen to me. But, I'm, you know, the truth is, once my last kid out of college, got out of college, I breathed a deep sigh. So my youngest child just turned 24. And it's like, you know what? I'll always be your dad and I hope to give you wisdom and always be there for you for as long as God gives me breath. But financially, bucko, you know, right now he's living at home because he's looking for, he's got, he's got a little job again. You know, he's working for the city with the pools and stuff because, mm. you know, that brings, that's like his college job, but he's looking for the real job as the first, you know, yeah, from his degree. And it's kind of hard to get launched. And, but it's like, you know, a, a whole bunch of things could collapse and, I could live. I could live. So I'm not terribly anxious about it, which can drive I, other people crazy. I was, I don't, I don't remember who I was talking to about this, but when you, I don't think I've tapped it into that, this, that's this part of Paul Vanderclay, but when I've watched you, especially I watched you on, um, I can't ever remember this, uh, Simone and, uh, Malcolm, Malcolm and Simone's based podcast, camp. based camp. Whenever you were on a recent podcast, well, you were on the Brendan, you did Brendan Graham's NC, but there was other, there was a one or two that I, where I see you as a participant. I think you were on this uh, guy who was reformed. There was a reformed guy that oh, was. Oh, yeah, yeah, that guy from Canada. Reformed yeah. Church of Canada. So I, when I watch you on podcasts, I, I see, I see you just going in, a, in, and, and I just think if this is my opinion for Paul Vanderclay, is, you take that into those uh, more status conversations. Um, I would, I would be, I would be interested in that because I just that is a side of you that doesn't get out there as much. You, you've done a ton of synthesis. You do have these conversations on occasion, but you know, I don't know. I, I think that some there's another part of you that comes out that is, um, that's really doing a special or something. You know, well, that's why I do. That's why I say yes to. You know, I'm not. You know, with Brendan Graham Dempsey, we we got all the way to the end of it, and it's like this is why I do what I do because I don't know you and you don't know me, and we just spent an hour and a half, in some ways, kind of talking past each other. So yeah. if at least I can understand who you are and you can understand who I am, we can actually be more productive in terms of dealing with these very large questions about modernity and Christianity and where this all goes. So, but I I like I like doing these conversations too they're they're fun and yeah. you know and and then people you know well if so i know i'm not going to name names i know people who were fairly rando and then they you know jordan peterson had him on his channel and it's always a double edged sword on one hand, let's say they had this little thing that they're building and doing. Of course, that just got all pumped up with ten, you know, many, many times more people now know about their little shtick. That's great. It's great for business. It's great for growing their thing. That's all great. But then there's always this other side of it, which is always way more complex. So I'm not, you know, I. Could I make my way? Uh, could I make my way onto Jordan Peterson's channel? Probably. I, I think I have enough relationships in that whole constellation around Jordan and to a degree with him that I could say, Jordan, I really want to be on your channel. Or I could probably more easily have Jordan Peterson on, which would be more fun for me to do a Randos conversation with Jordan Peterson. That would be more fun. But there's not necessarily a lot to learn because he's so public. All right, we would be doing two hours and there might be two or three tidbits that sort of come out that illuminate a few things, which would be fun. But I don't necessarily see, and a lot of people are like, well, if you went on Jordan Peterson and then your visibility, and then to, to a degree, Father Eric is right. Because when Father Eric says, well, this little corner dies the day Paul Vanderclay stops making videos. There's something right to that, and that it, there is a sense that many of the people find you and Grim Grizz and 
Many of the people find the other players in this corner because they first find me and then I talk about them and then you get a trickle down. But I'm trickle down beneath Jordan. And so if I had higher visibility then, and yes, but suddenly again, my channel goes from, first of all, you don't get the bump you think you'll get. Nobody has gotten more or better promotion from Jordan Peterson than Jonathan Peugeot. His channel has over 200,000 subs, which is great. But if you look at, let's if you pay attention, let's say to the metrics of the videos, what you get from a bump like that is a little bit of visibility. But I say you probably, you don't get what you think you're going to get, and you might not even get what you want. Because the truth is, I will take a small channel of good faith, participating people over a big channel that will only watch when I actually have some high status celebrity that they're interested in. And these metrics on YouTube tell us something, but I don't think any of us quite know what they actually tell us. Because for the most part, we don't even know what we want. Do I want to become rich? Well, you know, there are things in my life that being rich would be really convenient. You know, I, you know, there, there are certain things in my life that, yeah, if I had 10 times more money, I would do some things with that money. I can, things come to mind. But <laughs> I, I also know that, you know, even with my, unable to break 30,000 sub channel. I don't, I mean, I'll often have the experience at a conference or even just on randos that I had a con, I have a conversation with someone and I think, wow, it would be, it would be really fun to have a deeper, longer lasting relationship with that person. I really like that person. I get that sense when Jesus with the rich young ruler looks at him and the Gospel of Mark says, and he loved him. I think Peter saw that on Jesus' face. Jesus saw him and thought, you know, here's a here's a here's a good guy. He wants good things. But in the end, Jesus says, Why don't you sell everything you have? Get rid of all of that encumbrance you have in your life and join my merry band. Mm. But he goes away. And Peter gets Peter gets defensive. Haven't we sold everything, Jesus? I, you know, Jesus, Peter, <laughs> Peter's like in that meme with the guy looking at the Jesus looking at the rich young ruler. And like, Peter's what? like, "What about me? We've left everything to be with you. Is he your favorite now, Jesus?" And you get that at the end of the Gospel of John, you know, and and you know, Peter points at John. What about you? Get the sense that Peter Peter has insecure attachment to Jesus. So. <laughs> But, well, and for good reason. Yeah, yeah. So because but, he because know, he denies so, him. So all of this, what everybody wants in this world—the money, the fame, the status—it's not those aren't bad things necessarily. But look at Jordan Peterson's life. Yeah, you know, I, I, there's there are cautionary tales in there when you when you listen to him carefully. He winsomely talks about being a college professor. He winsomely talks about the the occupations that he lost, being a clinical psychologist. He looks back and realizes, can't do those things anymore. Hierarchies bind and blind. So if, if God gives them to you, blesses or curses you with them, you will have to deal with it. You see it all, all along in the Gospel of Mark. Jesus is like, all right, I'm going to do this. And of course, what exactly is going on with that? It's a big topic of conversation through the ages. I'm going to cure you. But don't tell anybody about it. Yeah. And you can get the sense that, you know, so Jesus comes back from Caesarea Philippi and there's so many people, he and his disciples can't even get a bite to eat. Is that good? Now they go down to Jerusalem and everyone abandons him. And right there in that story is a lesson about fame in this world. You know, again, I'm reading this this these accounts of Teresa of Avila. You know, 
she hated, she, she eventually, you know, she just prayed and prayed to God, please make it stop. Because, you know, she's just sitting there praying and suddenly she's the flying nun. And, you know, everybody, you know, they didn't have, they didn't have iPhones and Instagram, but word is spreading like crazy. And it's, a, and, and she's just like, can't I just be alone with you, Jesus? And God's like, eh, no, I got, I got some business to do with you. And if you say you're really my devoted servant, then you have to have a degree of comfort with the specifics of the servitude I am giving you. And that counts for both the one who serves in obscurity and the one who serves at the top of a hierarchy or in the limelight. Because when it's called it, when it when it's all said and done, servants of Jesus are servants of Jesus, and they serve in the way He calls them to. And so, if I am trying to serve Jesus in the way that I believe He has called me to, with all that I'm here, and there are frustrations about it, and there's cool things about it, yeah, and the cool things have way more temptation than the frustrations. Mm. Do you think that Peterson is picking up the biggest load he can to carry it across the room by starting ARC? Well, that's a good question. Yeah, I do. I, I think... So, Jordan... Like, what do you do with this Jordan status? Jordan wants to save Western civilization. That's a good thing to do. It's a good thing to want. It's a it's an awfully difficult thing. And so in that, it was wonderful when he mentioned Ark in his conversation with, with Schellenberger. I didn't get to that part. Oh, so he mentions, so he mentions Ark. He says, you know, because Schellenberg is like, we want to craft a political coalition to fight the wokesters. All right. We're going to need not the atheist plus, but we're going to need the old new atheist community. What do we do with, um, you know, with with Spencer and Pinker, because if we could have Spencer and Pinker on board, then we can. And Peterson's basically coming to the to conclusion that you're gonna, ha you cannot, you cannot exclude religion. That religion is at the base of this. And Peterson is right. If well, Christian ministers, says, Peterson is right. Shock of shocks. Um, but. You know, the, the outcome of that conversation as the guy who sent it to me, because I skipped it because I thought it was just more, you know, hand-wringing about wokeism. There's, there's plenty of hand-wringing about wokeism on the internet. That's fine. Wring your hands. Fine. But then Peterson launches off into the bigger issue, which for me, again, is the recession of modernity, or as he says, the end of the Enlightenment, or the however he's phrasing it on any given day. And and I and Peterson has come to the position that you can't do this without God, or a God of your own understanding, or the the you know the idea of God, or what have you. It's he he, he said that early on as a union that just that's how the world works psychologically with us, and now increasingly he's he's fleshing out that picture, and his wife is now, you know a member of the Roman Catholic church and his daughter is a member of an evangelical church. And he sees himself. He says that in this video to the Catholic when the Catholics like, please, please, please. Can you follow your wife to Rome? And he says, look, I'm a, I'm an outsider. I'm not a joiner for this stuff. I'm just not. And, and maybe he's right. And many people have made the observation that maybe for this particular for, for God to use him right now, it's best that he not bend the knee to Rome or join an Orthodox church or even become Christian Reformed, even relocate to Sacramento and join Living Stones. That'd be the, <laughs> that would be a disaster for Living Stones. I can't contemplate the disaster that would be for Living Stones. So, he, is where, he is wearing a, a suit blazer that says Jesus Christ on the back of it in most of his interviews right now. He is. He is. So, you know, and so you got to let Peterson be Peterson. He just who he is. So let him be like, let, let he, let, let, let him worry about his relationship with Jesus. Let them work it out. So, which is exactly what Peugeot says too. But, yeah. He went into it at the end of the conference. I had to kind of leave, but that he talked specifically about, was it, I don't know if this was on the, um, 
the digital versions. Like at the end of the conference, Peugeot talked about him and Peterson's uh, trip to Israel and what they did together. Yeah. Did 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 you see something? Was yeah, that on there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought that was. I mean, that may be oh. the the part of it. It's like the he he'll have to get, and this may happen, into more of the doing. Yeah. The the and, more of the procedural and the and the participatory knowing of God. I'm just I'm just glad Jordan Hall joined a Protestant church. <laughs> you need a little more balance. Yeah, I think that was. I, I would I would I would bless him if he if he joined an Orthodox church or a Catholic church too. It's not that. It's just the. I I think God has as rich a diversity of churches for a reason. And so I am a mere Christian mm. and that, you know, and then there, there's a few people around that would really like to see me be more over in promoting Dutch Calvinism and the Christian reformed church. And truth be told, especially in the early days when people would contact me, I can't find a church. The first thing I do is I look for a Christian reformed church and say, well, you could go there, which is fine. Um, but I, I know enough to know that, lots of different kinds of people need lots of different kinds of churches. And I, you know, again, I'm a, I'm a Protestant. And so I just want to see him get connected with Jesus. That's just what I yeah. want to see happen. It was, it, it stuck out to me so much. And that was the, the little video I made about him was Billy Graham saved Jordan Hall. That's what I titled it. I didn't, and I, I didn't see that title. Did you retitle it? I think it's I how Billy Graham got, saved and i it was kind of a wink and a nod but but that's yeah. because that's where his um his uh, monument and everything is and it's all surrounded by baptist camps and and uh and the presbyterian college out there oh and interesting I, and i just was so fascinated that that was the the land that he dropped into was the heart of evangelicalism in in a certain way yeah um i mean billy graham's chapels on the black mountain or like there's a rich well Something there is somewhere over there. It's all right there. That's Mount Athos for American evangelicalism. Yeah, and I just I found that wild, you know. And he he made a the reason we had a conversation was because he commented on it. He's like, yeah, that's about right. And guess what? That coffee shop owner goes to my church. <laughs> and, and and that doesn't surprise me. That doesn't surprise me. You know, I've lived most of my life um, around African Americans who are deeply Southern. Mm -hmm. I mean. You don't know African American culture unless you understand its southern roots. And it's, you know, history is complex that way. Um, and you know, the recently I saw some Hollywood person say, I'm not African American, I'm American. Mm. And they're right. And because they are American, they're completely American, they're fully American. Now, the history is complex and painful, but they're American. You know, it's it's so funny when I see African Americans, you know, maybe take a trip to Africa and they're like, yeah, yeah, you're you're further from Africa than I am from Holland, and that's pretty far. Mm. So it's just, and you know, we have an African church that meets on our on our on our facility on Sundays, and you know, it's I don't know, God's God's kingdom is beautiful, and um, and I love I love what He does with people. Yeah, I think that it's it is fascinating. I'll be I'll be fascinated if He. Can, if he holds on to it, you know, I think that's the interesting thing as, as all this is swirling around him and, um, this, the, the big Orthodox thing that's happened, the moment that's, that's happening with Peugeot and all this stuff. I, yeah. It will, I will be, I'll be interested to see how that journey continues to play out. Yeah. Yeah. Reason. You know, it's funny. We took a group to the, we took a group to the, um, Orthodox church in, um, in Southern California and a whole bunch of people went in there and said, I'm still Protestant. I mean, nothing against what's going on and praise God for, for the new life that's happened in so many people, but you know, I'm still, I, it doesn't hold much attraction to me and I could talk a lot about why or what, but there's no point to it. I, I, because that would be, that could be taken as, you know, criticizing or critiquing and, and for the most part, you know, if someone really pushes me, well, what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? But people have noticed that I don't want to major on those things on my channel. I don't. 
I don't want to fight about dogma. Now, if you get me in a corner, you could probably get me to scrap, but I don't necessarily want to spend my time doing it. I would Aren't rather... we all in a corner, Paul? Yeah, we are in a corner. <laughs> This little, this little, this little, how many things that begin with C. Um, yeah. But I, you know, I, I want to see people flourish. And, you know, I, there's no question that you know, Jonathan Peugeot has flourished in, in orthodoxy. Praise God for that. Jonathan Peugeot would not be the blessing he is to all of us, Protestant, Catholic, or Orthodox, if he hadn't, you know, devoted himself to the Orthodox Church. So that was that was my conversation with Nate Heil, you know, when he was talking about he landed in Anglicanism, and it seems to make sense, like on a certain kind of lineage. And I, I, I honestly can't. I don't think I can see myself like getting so far away from Protestantism. I think I will go deeper into Protestantism um, in the journey that I'm on, but I don't know if it crosses that threshold. Um, because it's it's just I think it's it's deeply part, and if you're gonna carve for a living, it makes sense to maybe go into a church that still values carving. <laughs> yeah. Oh, if you're an artist, you know, one of the artists in the corner said, you know, really wanted to have a conversation with me about Protestantism and art, and I said, yeah, there's issues there. Mm -hmm. Our iconoclasm, the early days of iconoclasm, has its consequences. Yeah. It just does. I feel it. Um, I in our big, we we rebuilt the oldest theater in the state of Arkansas and made it a a church. It was an old marquee theater. It's huge, you know, thirty foot ceilings. It has some interesting architecture, but there were no religious. We, we were still in this kind of like don't scare them off thing because it wasn't about the it wasn't about the idolatry. It was about the secularism. Right. Right. And that's now where where we land. And it was and now I'm kind of a part of this little community that we're doing some church together. And I was like, I want a cross. I want a cross. I want I don't want all you have is me. All you have is this guy preaching. All you have is this yeah. other person. All you have is this other person. I'm like, I want a cross that we can look at. Yeah. 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 That's that that's the way it goes. It's the way it always goes. And, and and again, it's the swinging back and forth. It is. And I, you know, one of the things that I learn as a local pastor is let people participate, even if their participation is cringy or theologically incorrect or, you know, within bounds, you know, there, there are lines that I'll, I most of the time don't have to draw a line. Because people kind of have a sense of it, and they'll, they'll ask me. I said, "Well, was well, it conscious or unconscious?" You know. Yeah, but most people, they're just let if if the church if there's no cringe in the church. So Rod Dreer posted this um, somewhere. Some church did their Easter thing was Back to the Future, and of course, their <laughs> Christ figure on the clock and the town hall, and it's yeah, just, it's just so cringe. But. Hmm. I know that they're trying to do a good thing. So, you know, you can kind of snicker at it, but there's a little bit of elitism and snickering at it. They're trying yeah, to do they're, a good thing. And who knows if in five or 10 years, they'll be cringing at themselves too. Yeah. 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 Cause, and you know, the, the funny thing again about art and Protestantism, the one area of art that Protestantism leaned heavily into, of course, was music. Right. Because he well, couldn't we, see it. Right. Exactly. But, and, you know, talk, talk to someone like Paul Ann Leitner and, and yourself, and they'll tell you some of the biggest idolatries in Protestantism are around the music. I, you don't, you're preaching to the choir, pun intended. Yep. Yep. That that was my point about kneel, the, you know, being in so many situations where people are literally literally kneeling before me as I'm yeah. playing rock and roll, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I yeah. mean, and and people kneel before the priest on a kneeler, so you know, there's there's issues there, but yeah. but yeah, I um, I'm actually interested in Paul. Um, I, I bumped into him on the internet the other day, and I well, I didn't you know haven't I done a conversation with Paul Ann Leitner? No. Oh, you. Definitely should. 
You well, help me, should. help me out, Paul. Help me, help me. You status. Do, you do, <laughs> you do. Just tell him Paul Vanderclay sent you. He's he's kind of busy. So we we haven't done a conversation re- recently, basically because of scheduling. His schedule and my schedule don't really work out too easily. But I mean, he did. He was deep into a lot of the the signs and wonders movement, and he, he was a worship leader, and I mean, all that stuff. So I think. Maybe it'd be boring to talk to him because you're both sort of, but you can compare notes. Yeah, I would, I would love he's that. He's a great guy. And he's learned a lot too about internet ministry. And because he, you know, he's played around with superhero movies and some of that because he's he's big into those kind of questions too. And he's he also really enjoys theology. So he's big into that. So, but he's he's a great guy to talk to. Well, maybe that maybe that can you can help me with that because I tried to find a way to contact him and I couldn't. Really? So. Just do it on Twitter. I guess I, would get, I don't know if he's on there right now. That's what I couldn't find. Oh, maybe for Lent he was off Twitter. Okay. Well, I, yeah. All right. Well, if you can't get him on Twitter, let me know and I'll hook you up. All right, Paul. Well, on this note. He, he's often looking for conversation partners. So. Well, I appreciate that. And I appreciate your time today. Um, this is... I don't think I can fully kind of like embody getting to this point to have an actually, you know, a real podcast with you. It's, it's a, it's, it's meaningful. And I mentioned that to you the first time my, my heart rate wasn't pumping this time before my, my first rando, it was like, okay, I feel like I'm, but it was, uh, but I'm, but it's an honor. I can tell you that. So oh, thank you. That's very, that's very kind. That's very kind. All right, man. Well, I'm going to hit a little video and we'll end this thing backstage. All right. Thank you, Paul. It's good to be here. Hi, this is Christian Baxter, and you're listening to Yours Truly, a place we go to think out loud.